that many tubers actually in the ground? Too long. <laughs> it took us too long. Um, it just depends. I think we got a late start to it this year. Um, so it probably took us about two months. Um, and that was mostly my husband and myself. And then we had one other person out there helping us part time plant them in. So it, it takes a really long time. Yeah. Luckily, we live in an area where we can let them overwinter, so we don't have to dig them up every year and redo it. We've got a couple of years before we'll dig back up again. That was going to be my next question because anytime I've had dahlia tubers when I purchase them, the people say, Oh, you have to dig them up every year, and then I hand them right back and say, ah, No, it goes in the ground and either dies or it doesn't. Yes, uh, yeah. I grow your own in my yard, but that's good to know. Is that like our what zone are we? Do you know? Are we 8B? Eight, eight, eight eight B? Yeah, okay. um, and it's just that, especially like where we're living, we don't have a lot of water coming in, so I'm not worried about them rotting out. We don't have um, really deep freezes that's going to freeze them out of the ground. You know, you'll lose some every now and then. The rain did just kind of puddle in that area, and you'll lose some of those tubers. But when you're looking at, you know, thousands of tubers, losing just a few is not really a big deal. And it's not worth the extra work of digging them up for us every year. Some people do, um, but that's just not what we're going to do. And storage space, you have to have a place to store them. And then it, it's dry storage, right? It has to be like ventilated crates or boxes or something? Again, depending on where you live. So with dahlias and those tubers, you're either trying to not dry them up or not rot them. Um, the goal for us is to have about a 90% humidity in our cooler area and keep the temperatures right around 40, 42 degrees. And when we do dig ours up, we put them in the big bulb crates. I don't use any type of media with it, but I dig them and I leave the soil on them mostly. Um, and then they're kind of in clumps. We might divide them into quarters or something just to save on room, but that works. Okay, so at 90% humidity, if you've been to flower school, you know that is kind of the target for cut flowers. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting it would be that for a, a tuber, a rhizome, something that isn't yeah. growing, but we're, we're not as humid as people think we are out here. No. And, you know, our cooler that we had them in had some leaks in there, and so, you know, the humidity was maybe a little bit higher sometimes, mm -hmm. but they were fine. They did pretty good until about late February, and then we started losing some of them. And again, I think that was just like excess moisture in there. And I didn't do a very good job of pulling a lot of the mother tubers off those clumps, and that would tend to rot um, at some point. So you want to get that mother tuber off of there. Interesting. Yeah, and some okay. that had those big honking mother tubers on there, um, they did rot. So what prompted you to put so many dahlias in? Is it just you love them? Is it the demand from our local market? How did you decide to go all in? Um, well, it was a couple of things, actually. So yeah, there's a big demand for dahlias. It's something that we grow really well on our farm. I think a lot of farms, you have to figure out what it is that you grow well and can you sell it. And so for us, yes, we grow them really well, and there's definitely a demand for the dahlia tubers. And it's just my favorite flower, so it really helps if it's something that you love to grow, you love to work with, and there's a market for it. Okay, cool. But yeah, do you have a question? Well, actually, Amy had a question uh -huh. for Linda, um, because she was very thrilled that you were back and um, here on the stage again. But her question was, when you do the winter for the dahlias, do you cover with plastic and mulch, or just mulch to winter them over? Good question. So that's a really good question, Amy. Um, for us, when we're planting ours, what we have done is we've used um, a piece of equipment that makes a raised bed of dirt, and then another one comes through and it drops drip line on it, and it also pulls over a plastic mulch. And that's what we've planted in. So it's a solid piece of plastic that's actually impermeable to water. Um, and that's it. That's what we leave down. We don't cover it with anything else. It's not open to the, you know, the wind or the air. Um, just those holes where the actual tubers were. And I know you didn't ask this, but another little trick that we do is I don't actually cut my tubers back. I don't cut the stalks back until the spring. And I think by not cutting them back, um, I'm not making that hole that could fill with rainwater and rot the tubers. Um, we just leave the stalks up. And then usually around April, they're dry. I go through and we hack them all down and clean it up from there. Wow, OK. So you have a machine that helps you with that. You're not yes. out there with just two <laughs> shovels and a bucket doing that. Uh, no. <laughs> I think it feels like it sometimes. Yeah. No, it's a machine, and I think it's called, is it a rainflow machine? What do we use? It's a rainflow. Um, rain, uh, it's a rainflow. Passive mulch layer. A, a passive mulch layer, something like that. If you look up, if you go online and you look up like a rainflow mulch layer, that's what we use. 
and we've had it for a couple of seasons now and last year was the first year that we actually used it to lay out our beds. We've got lots of people that are chiming in because of local grown flower farmer. Absolutely. And I just want to say a thank you to Sherry because she tagged Beth saying, Beth, you got to get on here. So anybody else out there who knows someone who needs to know more about growing and farming and flowering, tag them and get them on here. Excellent. Yes, tag your friends, share it with a flower farmer or a pot potential flower farmer, somebody who's interested in it. Uh, Linda is definitely a case study in how to do it the right way, if well. I would say. <laughs> I have been to the farm and it is glorious and addictive and um, I try not, I try to go as much as I can but at the same time it's dangerous when I go because I come back and I order all these new seed catalogs <laughs> like, I'm, and I'm going to plant things yeah. until they tell me I have to dig them up. So right now I am working with, yes these are not dahlias and I know that, but they are zinnias and do, what, do we know what her name is? Um, yes, this one is just a, a binary giant white one, that's it, just a white. It's, it's one of the big ones. It is massive. So here's a, a dahlia for comparison, and then here's another type of dahlia for comparison. So you've got really nice big heads. Um, it will add nice rhythm to my design. Through repetition. Through repetition, <laughs> yes. Yeah, got to get my $10 words in there, my, all my, my big girl words, you know, because, hey, class starts in a week and a half. I know. They yeah, just roll right at me. <laughs> We gotta <laughs> practice our teacher words. We have to practice our teacher words. Absolutely. And our knife skills. And our knife yes, and our knife skills. <laughs> and our knife skills. <laughs> but we do we use other tools as well. But um, speaking of tools, when you're harvesting, mm -hmm. tell me how that goes. So it's time to harvest the dahlias. What's your process? What do you go through to do that? Um, all right. So we just get out there. Um, sorry, Leanne, I don't use a knife in the field. I use my own Hanukkah clippers. I love them. Or a kick off of them. Um, but you know, you just go out and you need to be sure that the dahlia is ready. You'll get to know your dahlias and you'll know at what point you actually need to cut those. And then, gosh, we have tables set up with buckets. The buckets have water in it, fresh cold water. And then we just go down the line and um, we just start cutting. I bunch mine in fives. I keep rubber bands on my wrist. Um, tags in one hand or in my mouth and I'm pricing them as I bunch and cut. They go into those buckets. Once we get a few of those buckets full and it fills up the back of our Kubota, um, someone drives it up to the cooler and then in our walk-in cooler, we have buckets sitting in there with hydrofloor all ready for them, all cold, and they pick them up and they drop them in our buckets. Um, and we usually get about eight bunches in a bucket. Wow, I had to laugh when you said I have wrist, the rubber bands on my wrist. I meant to ask you, we're having a Madonna moment? Definitely Madonna. Or, or Madonna. What? But yeah, that's a great way to do that. Yeah. It's very handy. Keeps yeah. them where they're supposed to be. Um, how, how do you know when to cut, or do you cut at varying stages? Are you looking for a main bloom and a bud, or what's your, what's your thought process when you're harvesting? Okay, so how I do it, and every farmer has their own way, it's kind of a lot of it is just your personal preference, how you like those dahlias to look. Um, when I'm going through and cutting, I actually have already disbudded uh, most of my dahlias. I personally don't like all the little dancers that are up on top of them. I think it can look a little messy and they break off or they snag on things. Um, some people love them and that's great too. So I go through and I like a naked stem. So when I'm cutting my dahlia, if I can just take yep, one off. Snag one. Uh, gotcha. When I'm cutting my dahlia, I go through and I'm snipping off all the leaves and everything on it. I just prefer a nice smooth stem into my base arrangement. And you know, honestly, for florists, we don't want all those leaves and everything in our base anyways. They're going to take it off. Being a florist, I think that's part of why I'm already doing it in the field. Um, and then when I'm cutting, I'm looking at it, I want a nice length on it. So if you were to put it at your fingertip, for me, it goes just past my little notch up here in my elbow. And that's usually pretty close, 16 to 18 inches. Um, some of the dahlias, they just grow a little bit shorter, so I might only be getting 14 inches. And then I'm counting down on them. And usually where I'm cutting at, it's like at the second to third little notch where you have the sets of leaves. Always cut it above the next set of leaves because wherever that set of leaves is, it's going to give you two more stems. Oh, wow. So can you get two cuttings off your dahlias? Oh, my goodness. Um, way more than two cuttings. Really? Like, you know, per plant? Oh, yeah. I don't even know how many stems, but it's a lot. It depends on which kind it is. You know, some of those big ones, like the, um, the Cafe Ole ones, I don't get very many. They're bigger. It takes a long time. Uh -huh. The smaller ones, we get a lot of cuttings off of them. Um, we 
weekly. And honestly, I'm out there cutting, if not every day, every other day to go through. It just sort of depends. Oh, I'll return. But they really do throw up a lot of stems. If your soil is happy, you know, they're being watered, you're taking care of them, you're cutting them all the time. If you let it go and you're not cutting them, they're going to stop producing as much. So the more you cut, the more you get. Oh, be darn. I didn't know. You're fine. I'm totally fine. Yeah. I... I guess I've never thought of that. I mean, my yard, if I grew up with you, I know I get more mm -hmm. blooms, but I'm also not disbudding or working to get me a, a nice long stem. I just want more pretty. Yeah. So. And so then you're probably leaving it there and, you know, it's sending out a lot, like almost like a spray of them or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the deeper you cut, the longer your stems are going to be. I know it hurts to do that at first, but you have to cut deep. Yeah. I haven't. See, I can't do that. I can't do it on fruit trees. I can't do it on my flowers. I can't do fruit trees either. But I don't know. Yeah. The flowers, you're over it with the flowers. Yeah, over with the flowers. You just kill them randomly, you're fine with that. Yeah, I need to cut and sell as many as I can. <laughs> oh, too funny. All right, this thing's exciting. Maybe. But just something simple, not, not overthought, not overdesigned, just a pretty vase full of the bounty of the yard. Um, well, if your yard doesn't like this yard, not necessarily everybody's yard, but Leanne, what you got? So Scott just wanted to compliment you on that color harmony. I absolutely adored it. Thank and, you, Scott. And um, Vega said they try to get dahlias in Iceland, but they die very, very quickly, evidently, because they don't like to ship into Iceland. They're doing too long in transit, maybe, or something. Oh, and you. then just a shout out to all of our tulips that are li listening and watching from very rainy areas because we have many people down in the south where they are experiencing some of the effects from the hurricane absolutely absolutely um do we have any first timers with us has anybody chimed in and said this is their first time on live with us not yet not yet well and maybe not maybe you've all been here before and you know how much fun it is and you just keep coming back so um, this is a great question for Linda yeah. um, from Scott. How long from plant to flower for your dahlias? Okay, so um, as I said, we got a lot of them in a little bit late this year, but typically about 90 days from the time they go in. So you want to put those tubers in if you are planting a whole new crop of them when your soil temperature is maybe around 50, 55 degrees. Otherwise, they're just going to sit there and not do a whole lot of anything. Um, about 90 days from there. But you have to make sure that your soil is damp. Um, don't make the mistake of letting your soil be bone dry. When that happens, that tuber is just not going to wake up or it's going to take a really, really long time. Um, so it needs to be a little bit damp. And then the warmer the weather is, the quicker it's going to grow. So some of those tubers that I put in, like say in May, it took them May, June, July, yeah, about two and a half months um, to actually start, you know, getting flowers that I could cut in some of the early ones. But then again, some of the ones that I planted a little bit later, and I already had water going in those beds, they were a little bit quicker too. So some of it just depends on your variety. Interesting. Okay. Um, I got all excited because I turned around and I saw the beautiful Queen Anne's Lace. I just love this. I absolutely love this. And it, now is this considered a chocolate? It's the Dara, it's chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate, so okay. The Queen Anne's Lace is um, usually that white one that you might see like, on the side of the side road. Of the road yeah. yes. But that's the Dara. And I love it when it starts to change into the seed pod form, like you have up here, how they're mm -hmm. curling up like that. I think kind of looks so like dill cool. a little oh, bit. Oh, it does, yeah. But some people don't like the smell of dill. Well, some people don't like the smell of Queen Anne's Lace either, but you know. Yes, yeah. That's fine. It's, it's a personal thing. But that chocolate color is so pretty and it looks so good for the Pfizer purpose. Yes, and I had talked about putting it in there and then I moved it off to the side until I turned around and then I went, oh yeah, look. Oh. Yeah, I think that adds just a little bit of extra, extra, a little extra, some whimsy to it. See, I'd want that in my foyer in the entryway if I had one. <laughs> right, so, yeah, in, <laughs> in, the my, room, in my yeah. grand, my grand That's uh, right. French that chateau. Is, that looks beautiful on camera, absolutely gorgeous. Oh good, 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 good. Um, so next up, again, more dahlias. Um, we've used this container a lot, and it's just a fun one because it has so many colors, and if you know me, it's got sparkles. I like the sparkles. So have some of that, but I want to feature some of those zinnias that you brought because they are just so, I don't know, I'm just in love with them, and 
I know you obviously like them because you're planting them. Yeah. But do you do you have a favorite variety? Do you like the little short fiber ones or the like the big white ones? Oh, or gosh, I love them all so much. Um, I love everything in the Queen Line series. Um, I don't even know what all these names are because they're all mixed. But you know, there's like the Queen Line Blotch. There's the Queen Line Orange. Queen line red. I just think they're all so pretty, and I think that you can just kind of grab them all up and they look good in a vase like that, too. But I love the big ones also, like you were using the Veneri Giants. I do yes. love those solid big, and I think really those are the only ones I plant, except for maybe some Persian carpet little ones that are kind of fiddly. Yeah. Like little, yeah, like size ones, mm -hmm. or and even smaller. And like I'll cut some for fun, they're really nice to use in maybe pumpkin arrangements or something tiny. But it's one of those fiddly things that I normally don't like to grow, but I just feel like I should put them out there, so I do. <laughs> Never an ounce of soil I use, let me tell no. you. <laughs> so you were telling me that you just took over another section of the fields yeah. and added how many acres more of product? Four, maybe? That's a lot. Three, maybe three, four, okay. yeah. And so, you know, it's a work in progress because for us, it's all been pasture for years. Um, we've had our place for about 15 years, and it's been pasture, and we've had livestock on it. Um, so you, you have to go through, and you have to get rid of all that grass. You've got to prep it. It is just so much work. We've made our mistake in the past, and not so recent past, where we haven't done enough prep work on it, and then that grass is still coming back. So it's, it's a long term. We've got um, probably another two or three acres that we're going to move into this fall and just start prepping it so that we can plant next spring. Nice, yeah. very nice. So t t total acres planted in flowers is how much? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. So we Where have, did Angelo go? Well, yeah, how many acres? acres? You, 11 this maybe at this point? Fancy number. Uh, maybe 11. Maybe 11. 11. You know, okay. It's kind of hard because when we had our farm, um, we started off with more of like the homesteading. So we had our vegetables, we had different livestock animals that we were doing. And as the flowers just kind of grew and grew, we were inching all that else out and then just putting in plots of flowers or like our orchard now, we don't really do much with the fruit, but we're using all those branches for flower arrangements. Um, so, you know, there's different areas, but I'd say about 11 acres out of the 17 so far. Wow. Yeah. And speaking of fruit, you brought in, was that blackberry branches? Yeah. And I didn't get them into the studio, but I'm not exaggerating. They are taller than me, so they're like seven feet. I'm not six feet tall, but they're like seven. Yeah. They're huge. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they're really lovely right now. And that was just me cutting as far as my short little arms. Great. Really yeah. <laughs> well, that happens. So right now, what I'm working with is uh, that cool container again, and I just have um, water with flower food in it, and then floral netting, just chicken wire shoved down in there. Um, and then this gorgeous foliage. Does anybody know what this is? If you know what it is, type it in there, okay? I'm not gonna tell you yet. Let's see if you guys can tell by seeing it on camera. Um, I had to do a double take when I saw it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. It worked out really good for the colors. It did, it was super pretty. I yeah. love it, love, love, love it. It makes me think about doing something with mine. <laughs> so then while they're figuring out what that foliage is, tell me what these little beauties are. Oh, this is deconstructed echinacea. You like that term? I do, good girl, yeah. Um, these were just some, oh, it's an echinacea called The Price is White. Um, they're not white, Linda. They're not, but the petals <laughs> were. And it was actually kind of an ivory color. Um, but I hadn't cut from them in a long time, and I was sick of looking at them, and I thought, well, I should probably get them for the seed heads. So I just cut them down, stripped off all the leaves, and then just pulled off the petals on the outside. But and they're fancy. It's a neat texture, yeah. Well, it's a wonderful texture. It's, it's thistle-like. But it's not. I mean, if I were doing this with, um, oh, Econops or Eurygium, unless it was super fresh, I'd be crying. And it's just, it's like a, like a, uh, I don't know, like a Brillo, not a Brillo pad. Like a hairbrush. Like a hairbrush, yeah. yeah that's, that's a good term. Um, so they're very pliable, and will these dry? They will. Okay. So, you know, I, some of you may not know this, but this cone forms as the plant is getting older, as the stem is getting older. Um, it'll go from like a flat disc to a little bit rounded like this, and then up to this really big cone here. And if I were to leave this on the plant, this would just turn to seeds that would drop and try to reseed. But if I want to dry them, what you do is you, you cut them all down, you bunch them up, make sure you take off all those extra leaves, you don't want anything to mold on it, and then you just hang them upside down and in a couple of weeks they'll turn dark 
and they can last a long time. Uh, some people told me they've lasted about a year. Wow. So now that is a flower value, yeah. right? You buy your fresh products. If you're a florist and you're designing with it, obviously, kind of like sunflowers, you can work with it in its mm -hmm. entire form or detach the petals and deconstruct it, work with it just as an interesting form and texture, and then dry it and then tuck it into something else. Yeah. And of course, if you didn't like it when it was brown, you could probably paint it gold or oh, yeah. or something. That's great paint for the wind. What you got, Carolyn? I've got two things. All right. Um, Judy was the first one to chime in on her guess for that foliage, okay. and she said peony leaves. She's correct. That is what they are. <laughs> Very cool. And then Tomasi has a wonderful question. Do you ever um, have any problems with the dahlia virus? And if so, oh how is it being for this? <laughs> <laughs> and um, go. Okay, so this has been coming up a real lot with all the dahlia growers. We have so many new growers and we're seeing more and more about it. Um, yes, I have had a problem with the virus in the past. I think when I was first seeing some of it, I didn't know what it was. There just wasn't that much information in your face all the time or every time you go on a forum and you see all of it. Uh, for me personally, I don't sell tubers to anyone. And if I see something that isn't growing right and it's all stunted, I'll just go ahead and pull that plant out and toss it out. But I do replant in that area again the next year. Um, again, I'm not selling tubers to anyone else. I've read a lot of articles and there's some really good books out there. And they talk about, I think it's something maybe 85% of all of our dahlias have some type of either virus or, you know, something going on with it that we don't want. I think that's just the nature of it at this point. Um, like cows. <laughs> you know, I would never sell those tubers to anyone um, knowing that some of them could have that. That's why people ask me, do I sell tubers? And I'm always like, nope, just the cut flowers. So that's my answer. Excellent. I hadn't even heard of it that yeah. there was a concern. But I guess with any growing mm -hmm. flower or plant or something, you're going to find, I just yeah. cut his little head with my knife. Oopsie. So Amy, Jason, and Sherry all got it too over here. So Facebook Excellent. is on it as well. So. Excellent. Well, good job, folks. Yes, it is peony foliage after it started to turn. And um, it may or may not show up on camera very well, but it has a lovely um, picoty edge to it. There's just a little, I call it a, a dark copper or rust edge to the leaves. And it adds a lot of... I don't know, it, it makes them look like you've outlined them with red Sharpie marker. It's very cool, adds some neat color and texture. Yes, Leanne? Sherry would like to know, have you ever started values from seed? Oh. No. <laughs> no, I don't have time. How do you have time for this? <laughs> um, no, I have not. Um, I've seen a lot of really cool dahlias coming on. It looks like so many of them have that open face. And that's not what I want in mind because um, the florist that I'm selling to, in general, they don't want an open face dahlia. But people are doing some really remarkable things with the seeds. And I prefer to know exactly what I'm growing. So I want to make sure that every year what I'm growing looks just like that mother plant that I've already liked. So I don't do seeds, I just do the tubers. Interesting. Okay. Now, I know these aren't dahlias, but we were talking um, before we got in the studio about just the color variation within one plant. And you think this is all one variety, right? There could be maybe two varieties okay. mixed in there, but yeah. Yeah. I think it's like the, someone's going to correct me. I think it's like maybe the queen lime blotch on one of them, and then probably queen lime orange, I think would be the other one. Yeah. But what a fun, uh, a fun way to get variety just within one it bunch. It is. You can just go down the row and you have a little variation with everything, and I think it's so pretty. It adds so much more interest. I'm just loving all of this. I had no idea you were using this peony foliage when I came in, and the color just looks so good with it. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. She sent me a, a list last night with these big, long words, and I, I know some of my Latin names. I don't know all of them. And she had something in here, and I said, oh, that looks like nine mark. And she goes, it is. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, but she sent me a picture. So I had kind of a visual of what I was working with, but um, I mean, y'all know me. Red might be my favorite color, but orange, come on, seriously. All the, all the tints, tones, and shades of orange. Um, this just screams fall to me. It is. I'm just like, wow. And I know only in August, or not only in August. We're still in August. A couple more days. What's today? 30th. Tomorrow's the last day. Well, it's the full moon today. And we have a full moon. Oh my gosh. So Leanne, what do you have going on? 
Well, Scott is wanting to know, do you grow what people are requesting or do you grow what you want and tell them what they can hear? <laughs> <laughs> um, both. I, I love to grow what I love. And I know that there's really wise words out there that will tell you, you know, you have to grow what um, people are asking. So I, I do that too. But if it's something I love and I see it and I think it looks different, I'm going to grow that. I'm a florist also. And so for me, it's so rewarding to be able to go out in my field and pick out things that I absolutely love. And when it's um, really hot out or the weather's bad and you're super tired, it just is no fun to go out there and harvest things that someone else wants but that you don't enjoy growing. And that's the truth. That's why I don't like the fiddly things. People ask me to grow them and I'm like, eh, no, no. Nope, I've got to like what I grow. <laughs> so, what, so since you brought that up, what is the most requested fiddly thing that you won't grow? Scabiosas. Really? <laughs> yeah, for me. Okay, Some why people do you love them. Fiddly? You have to cut them all the time. You can't miss a schedule. If you walk by it and you're like, oh, I better cut those today, you come back a few hours later and they're like, hey, here I am, and they're all over the place. Um, I think they need netting in my soil. My soil is pretty rich, and they just grow so tall and um, just all over. You have to stay on top of them. You have to keep cutting, and I don't really have time for that, and I don't enjoy that. I love something like a deli or a zinnia where I go out, and it's an easy cut, and you're bundling, and you're done. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't even tell it, and it behaves. Yes. <laughs> but you have grown scabios. Okay, you've, you've been out. Them. Yes, I'm pretty sure. You look at them, and you're like, they're beautiful, and I'm like, yeah, you, you, you can cut them. Yeah. I need to mow those down. Um, I'll buy them from someone else. You should go ahead and sell them to me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of other varieties of things, what is this? This is Trilova, and it's one of the Rebecca's, and I just love it. This is my first year of growing it myself. Um, I bought it from other people. It's a tender perennial, so I expect it to come back probably the next like three years or so before it maybe starts dying out, and I'll put some more in. Um, I think on this one, I should have probably pinched it, cut it down at about six to eight inches, so it would have sent out longer laterals for me. I didn't, I forgot about it way out there in my field. <laughs> I just saw something yellow, and I'm like, what is that over there? I'm like, oh, I better cut it. So they're kind of bushy, and I've been cutting out like that central stem, and then hoping the side ones will shoot out and give me some longer ones. I love them. I would say, if I were comparing it to something you might know, I would say to a Viking palm, mm -hmm. or you put um, a Rebecca or a small sunflower in the dryer on high heat and just shrunk the stink out of it. <laughs> That's basically what it looks like. Like a brown eyed Susan. Yeah, like a brown eyed Susan. Yeah. It is just botanically perfect. And if I had a pencil, I'd sketch it, but we're live, so I have to stick it in a face. Yeah, they're so delicate, but they're sturdy, too. Yeah, they're so delicate. The stems are fantastic. They're on stiff, this. right? Yeah, they're very yeah. stiff. Here those are the short ones. Yeah, those, those are pretty good. That's, yeah. Get, you're getting lots of hearts on that arrangement oh, good. over here on YouTube, but Christina would like to know how you feel about marigolds. <laughs> I don't know how she feels about marigolds. <laughs> you get my laugh? I, I have a lot of them. I, I grew so many. So last year, I couldn't keep up with the man with marigolds. Um, I sold, like I swear, every single bunch unless I broke the heads or something. So I planted more of them this year, and I'm not selling a whole lot, but I know we have a lot of growers who are selling marigolds right now, so I think maybe our market just is a little saturated in those. I love the smell. I love the smell of the foliage. A lot of people don't like it. I think it's, um, it makes me think of fall. It makes me happy when I smell that. So I'm growing several different varieties of those two. Um, one of them, the, I think it's white swan maybe. It's like that white one. It took a real long time for it to become a useful marigold. It stayed short forever, and I just had to keep cutting it and throwing all that off into the side. But um, it's looking better now, so I love marigolds. I knew you loved them, but I did not know you liked the smell. I don't, you don't like the smell? No. I thought you were my friend. Well, I am, <laughs> but you know. I like it too. You do too? You do like the smell of it? See, I put, you know, it reminds me of fall. Like, it yeah. does smell like it does smell like fall, but I put it in my well, garden. That's not a <laughs> I know, I know. I know. But I put it in my garden to keep the bugs away. Yeah. The stink. Ah, oh, the smell is Oh, okay. Leanne, how about you? What you got? Okay. Well, a, if you don't like the smell, they can go to the Tulip Tuesday tips on how to get that out. Correct. That, that's not the question. The question <laughs> is from Marcel. Uh huh. How much sun do you recommend for dahlias to grow well? Oh, um, we were just talking about our farm has no shade unless you're standing in our orchard. 
Um, so the more sun, the better. I think probably the only caveat to that is if it gets super hot, like when we have a heat wave, the foliage will burn with so much sun. And then either you're just going to deal with that and, you know, kind of pick it off and clean it off, or some people do an overhead watering on it. We just tend to irrigate everything with drip tape when it's really hot. But I would say the more sun, the better. Okay, I'm, I'm staring at the arrangement with the smirk on my face, not because I think it's so fantastic, but there is the cutest little bug that's just cruising around on this zinnia in here. Oh, it better not be a cucumber beetle. Is it? Oh, no, I don't know what that is. No, no. It's just a happy little He's bit guy. Happy I know little it's a little Oh, we're still in. Yeah. That's all right. I don't know if you can see him cruising around on the petals there, but he was, he was just super cute, and I thought, well, he wanted to be on mine He's today. Happy. Yeah. He's very oh, happy. Oh, yeah, he shows. Oh, my God. Does he? I was just, and I flicked him sort of, I gently flicked him sort of off, and he came back. It's like, dude, you're happy. I'm going to leave you where you are. All right, we're going to move that one out yes, of the way. Yes, I'm not taking that one home with me. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up my mess here. So, of the 463,000 Dahlia varieties that you have, what's your favorite? What, uh, okay, that's not fair. Yeah, they're all That's favorite. not fair. Um, give me your favorite white, okay. your favorite peachy, pinky, blushy, wedding-y one, okay. and then your favorite weirdo. Oh, okay. Um, my favorite white, new to me this year, but it's been around for a long time, it's Rycroft Jan, and it's um, a smaller ball, and did I bring one in? That might be, it might be one of these over here. But anyways, it's a, a really beautiful, um, I'd say like a creamy ivory white ball. That is my favorite. They are perfect every single time. They're just beautiful. They're, I'm like, this big across. So they work great on the arrangements. They're not too big. Uh -huh. um, the stems are long and to die for, and they are so prolific. So that's my favorite white one. Okay. Um, my favorite peachy, oh, I love this one right here. This one is Henriette. It's a semi-cactus, um, and that's like a light peach to me. I love this one. Do you like that? I do. Do you call it peach? That's the thing, is like, you know, some of them are peachy pink, is it orangey peach, you know, everyone sees color a little bit different, but I think this might be my favorite one, it's kind of a weirdo one too. Not everyone likes a semi-cactus, but I think it's beautiful and sturdy. Excellent. And... Leanne. Well, well back to the bug issue. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, Yala Reedy would like to know, do bed bugs come with flowers? Because there's an office that she's aware of that doesn't allow flowers anymore because they will get bed bugs. Bed bugs? I've never, never heard of bed that. bugs with flowers. I have never heard of that at yeah. all. I have stayed in a hotel before that I've heard about yeah, bed too. bugs. Um, no flowers were there. I don't think so. That's not something I know about. I don't know what the relationship would be with that. Mm, I don't either. Look, let's hope no is the answer yeah. to that, but I, I don't know for sure. So I interrupted you. So you gave no, me your white bed bugs with that. Sent a dream, right? Yeah. And you gave me your so you gave me your white and, my peachy and your one. peachy and then your favorite weirdo, like unusual variety or okay. Just, I think my husband might know. There's probably two. French can can. Yeah, he's not. He said yes. I love French can can. I almost brought her in today and I forgot. Darn it. But um, it's this huge big head like this. Look it up. Go look up French can can. It's got like orange and like a cherry red orange in it, and it's not really striped. Um, it's beautiful, and I personally hate the colors red and yellow and orange together, so it's not like that. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous, and all the petals underneath it have kind of like that ruby color, too. It's beautiful. I love that one. That's my favorite weirdo. Okay. I should bring one in. Interesting. Some point. I'll have it at my market booth. You'll have to come by. Okay, I'll, I'll have to yeah. come by and check that out. I, um, I'm just always fascinated by the transition of colors in the dahlias because we were, you were talking about, well, don't you see peach in this? And I was thinking as you said that, well, this one's kind of corally, and then I went, but but no, it's not, but it's kind of pink, but it's got yellow, but, but, but. That one's pink runner. Okay, so um, it's pink. And I do love that one, and the center part, when they're just opening and they're ready to cut, in our field, the center almost has a little bit of a lavender, um, a little bit of lavender hue to it, I think, with that pink, and it can look really pretty. And I know it changes a lot, too, with our weather. So when it's nice and cool, I'm seeing a little bit more of that purple into the center um, mm -hmm. than I do when it's when it's warmer out. That's like that with a lot of the dahlias. They change with the temperatures. I, I wonder, is that problematic for you when you're do? Do you grow for people? Like if I called and said, hey, I, I you know, earlier, mm -hmm. I have a, a wedding coming 
up and I really need um, a specific color or variety? Is that something that you do or do you, again, do you just I, you buy what I have? Well, it depends. So I definitely do that when you're my bride. If I'm the florist doing your wedding and we're planning it out ahead of time, I've done that many, many times. And a lot of times it's they want the, um, the sweet Natalie, they want the cafe au lait, and I will go ahead and work with that bride and grow for them with no um, promise that they're going to actually make it and bloom right, but we're going to try and do that. And that's really fun. Um, so if you're my bride, I, I may do that. Gotcha. If you are a florist, I'm not going to grow for you, but I do go for the wholesale market, and I have had um, some of my reps down there have requested like a particular dahlia over and over, and I wasn't growing it. So this year I planted it, and I'm growing for them, so I can have that. Okay, cool. That's Mostly nice. because I stick with the colors and the forms. You know, it might be more. You may call me as a florist, and you know, I need white balls. I want really big ones, or I want smaller ones, or something like that. Okay, very. That's good. cool. I just, I'm totally loving these zinnias. I, they always make me happy. They should have been a zinnia show. Well, <laughs> uh, zinnias and dahlias. Yeah. They're very similar looking, I guess I would say. Similar forms. Um, but definitely, <laughs> Carol, what do you call them? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember this true nickname, but like the, the dirty version of a dahlia. The, di the dirty, dirty dahlia. dahlia. The dirty cousin or something like that. <laughs> Kind of that the, is so, that's the, my favorite one. Redheaded stepchild of the flower, the zinnia to the dahlia. Those are um, super cool dahlias. I love very, that. Very, very juicy. So this one is probably the clean light mm, red, I'm thinking. And then what is this Ooh. fun stuff? Okay, another first year for me. Um, this is Eucatorium. This is Little Joe. And it's a perennial. Um, it can get pretty big. I think it can get up to about seven feet. It likes it a little bit moist where you plant it. I have mine planted in full sun. I have about 100 of these. Um, just a big, long row. And, um, and they just grow and get bigger and bigger. And the more you cut, the more it grows. It's kind of fun because, to me, I don't know if you can see, well, maybe like right here. But to me, this looks a little bit like rice flour when it's more of that just ready to cut stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks like a rice flour. And I've used it a lot of times to replace that. And then as it matures, it'll get a little bit more fuzzy. And then eventually it's going to open up and be kind of brown when it's completely all fuzzed out and open. But it lasts a good week for me. And does it dry? Do you know if it dries? I don't know if it dries. Um, I should find out because I'm just getting into drying flowers. So my husband can build me another dry room or something. <laughs> Add that to the list, Ange. <laughs> more, more projects for Angelo to build. I think it has a neat scent. So then um, going back, uh -huh. Scott is wanting to know Linda. Looking at all the stuff on the back counter, is it all yours from the farm? Um, I think it's, I think there's a little bit of maybe some spiral yuke and some of the grasses and ruscus that's not mine. This beautiful one's not mine, although I am growing some. Um, Euralia's not mine. The peony leaves weren't mine. But all the flowers are yours. Yep. Yes. And, yeah, the foliages. It's a veritable um, fairyland on the farm during the summer because yeah. there's just so much going on. I believe in variety and a lot of it. I know some people think, um, you know, just grow a few things, but a lot of it, and I'm more of a grow a lot of it and a lot of variety. I like it all. What is your next target for planting? Your next, I guess I should say your next obsession, because you don't just buy five of something, you buy 500 of something. Um, I think we're just, I'm just continuing with the perennials. I feel like I'm in a really good place right now mm -hmm. where I can propagate most of what I already have. Mm -hmm. um, I think just continuing with perennials. I love having all the shrubs out there. It's amazing as a florist myself to be able to just like walk outside and cut my foliages that I want and it can really elevate whatever arrangement I'm doing if I'm doing an event or something um, to have my own eucalyptus, my own baptisia. So lots more, lots more perennials. And you know right now there are you know, 200 florists watching us going, I know. she just gets to walk out and cut that. But, but I charge appropriately, so. Excellent. Yeah. I, that's, a great, that's a great point to bring out, yes. that you don't just grow it and it's free no, to it's not the free. flower side, to the uh, florist side of the business. No. Yeah. No, nope. there's a lot of labor involved in that. Oh my goodness, yes. It's so pretty, Michelle. Oh, well, thank I you. I love it. If I practice, maybe I can get a job. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, 
it's, it would be impossible to make an arrangement that wasn't pretty with the product. So that's that speaks more to you than to whatever I'm doing with the flowers. So um, it. What's the phrase? A good florist can work with anything, but it never hurts to have good product. Yeah. Either. Leanne, what do you have going on? Well, this is a question that actually I was like, ooh, I want to know this too. Uh oh. Yawa really would like to know. What is a typical day on the farm? Oh, wow. So, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my day, um, I won't lie, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> um, I'll wake up somewhere between 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning, and I have an espresso machine, and I use that. Um, I'll have a couple cups of espresso with my heavy cream. I'm checking all my orders. I'm going through you know, my emails or whatever. And then I like to get outside. It's uh, a little bit darker right now. The sun's not up as early. It's a little bit after six before it's light enough for me to see. But um, I just go outside and I usually kind of go around and I check everything to see if there's something coming on, like that triloba that I forgot about. So I have a good idea of what it is that I need to pay attention to. And I just go out and I start cutting and harvesting. Um, if I have orders from florists or from our reps down at the market, I have those on like clipboards and I'm filling all of those. This year we actually hired um, some crew members. It's the first time we've hired people, and so I'm kind of figuring that out. They're part time, and I'm loving it. It's helped her a lot. Um, they're washing buckets for me, which is giant. Um, filling my cooler, sanitizing. I love it. And I've got a couple of them who are actually I'm getting pretty good at cutting flowers with me or just bundling. And so I have to go and make sure that I know where we're working together. And I go through and do that. Um, in the afternoon during the summer when it was really hot, probably about 1.30, 2 o'clock, um, I called it quits for about an hour and a half. I went and got some lunch, got something to drink, kind of composed myself, and then went back out again. And I pretty much do that all day until dark. If we're running product into the market, um, sometimes we leave around 5.30 at night and I go run it in and get it in our cooler space down there. Um, sometimes we're doing it really early in the morning, like a 4 a.m. run, and then get back and do it all over again. So that's nonstop. So when, when you sleep, there was no mention of sleep anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to say how early I go to bed nowadays, but at 10.30 is the latest you'll ever see me awake, unless I wake up in the middle of the night and I had a really good idea of a new tuber I want to buy or something. Oh my goodness. But no, I mean, yeah, I'm in bed and then I'm up early, early to bed, early to get up. That is crazy. Carolyn, what have you got Another over there? Fun question over here on YouTube, and they're wanting to know if you ever have tried dot, um, drying your own dahlias. Just now. We were, we were talking about, about this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, no. I just started. So I tried it. I have some of those ripe hop jams that I was saying how much I like, those white ones. And I have them in bunches. And I have them hung upside down in my shop. And they're drying. And they're turning out a really kind of cool, antique color, kind of papery. That looks pretty neat. I did just buy some silica gel cat litter because I'm kind of cheap. <laughs> that was the cheapest one. I'm thrifty. Amazon. She's thrifty. I'm thrifty. Not cheap. She's yes, thrifty. Yes, I'm thrifty. And um, I'm trying some laying them out, but I'm finding that I need quite a bit of it to do very many. So I have a cat litter pan and I have a five pound bag. It doesn't do very many dahlias in there. I need a really long one and I need to come up with a better wholesale pricing or something on that silica gel. But they're turning out really cool. Yeah. And what do you think you'll do with them? Just have them as an offering in the floor I'm side of the business. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I have them. I don't know. They're mine. Shoeboxes. No. <laughs> Dahlias. No, um, my plan is we grow a lot of Concord grapes. And so I'm making wreaths, the bases with those, right? Oh, and wow. then I'm going to um, embellish, another teacher word. Yes. I'm going to embellish those grapevine wreaths um, this fall and winter and um, attach the different dried flowers and grasses and foliages on there and sell them. Wow. Yeah. I, I wanted to do that idea. for a long time, but I haven't had the time, the inclination. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Between midnight and 4 a.m. Yeah, I'm really sleeping. That, yeah. <laughs> So we'll be that'll be very cool. Mm -hmm. Now will those be a two order item? I don't know. Or yet. just to make them because they're fun. Uh, well, make them because they're fun, but then I have to sell them because my time is worth something. Exactly. So oh, um, yes. yeah, I'm not sure. We'll see how many we can knock out. I want to trial some and kind of see how they hold up. I think it would be more of a covered area or in your house with the dry flowers because I'd be concerned it would pick up too much moisture if it was outside. Um, but that's what I plan on doing. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking Teacher Carolyn over here, I'm like, what about these? And she's like, 
Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll add that. I got a little carried away with the mint, but it smells so good. Now, is this a special variety? Is this spearmint or minty mint? Or that one know? is. I call it Kentucky Kernel. Maybe it's just Kentucky Mint. I, maybe I added the kernel to it, but um, I don't know. I so read it every day. Yeah, I was hungry. Um, so anyways, what I do with that one is uh, we just have it in some beds out there growing, and it gets pretty crazy tall. They have really nice stiff stems, and I went ahead and cut some once it started to flower, and I really like the flower part on it, too. Yeah, it's super. It's, it's stiff. It's very stiff, very mm -hmm. sturdy. I like I like that um, component of it. Yeah. yeah. Question? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things here. There's a lot of commenting that they're tired just listening to your day. <laughs> and then uh, several commented that they too have used the cat sand to dry flowers and it worked very, very well. Oh, good to know. And then the last one is a question. Those are comments, but there's a question of, do you, and I love this because I know I must know the answer, do you harvest when it rains or do you wait for it to stop? <laughs> Sorry, I can't you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you harvest, yes, yeah. um, you harvest. Uh, you don't want to put the wet flowers into the cooler immediately, but practically speaking, um, they're going to be wet. I mean, I know if you're smaller scale, they can say go ahead and run some fans on them. I mean, I'm not going to bring them in soggy, and I will take the bunch and, you know, kind of shake it like this and jostle. And generally, by the time that I get it up to where our cooler is and it sits for a few minutes, it's not quite so wet anymore. But, I mean, I have to. There's days where, I mean, you could go a couple of days without harvesting, and that would be bad for your flowers. So, no, I harvest every day. Rain or shine. I was going to say, it's Oregon. You could go for a month. And, yeah. And, and I haven't had, and that's the big thing, is I don't have a problem with mold or anything like that happening. I think so much of it is your clean handling, your environment. You know, everything gets wiped down with ECD, and, mm -hmm. um, but it does rain, so, yeah. And then a question back to Dally is one that I have, and we've covered it, and we've done uh, two of Tuesdays on it before, but kind of go over care and handling on a Dahlia. What's the, the cut to design oh. life of it? Okay, so we talked a little bit about it. Um, it starts off with, I've got clean cutters in the field. Um, I have buckets that we have washed and sanitized with DCD, and every time we go out to cut, those buckets are clean like that. I cut, because we have such a quick turnaround in the field, they're not just like sitting out there for hours or anything, I cut directly into clean cold water that goes in my buckets, and then we're filling up the back of, I call it my little tuck tuck, but it's a little Kubota thing, and I think we can get like maybe 16 buckets in the back of it. Um, when they're filled, they go right up to the cooler, and at the cooler in there, we have those clean sanitized buckets and they're filled with hydrofluor is what I use. And it's a good solution that um, keeps bacteria from forming in the buckets. And again, all of it is just your care and handling. You want to make sure everything's washed and sanitized. No dirty buckets anywhere. Um, so they go into them. They're on the shelves. They're in there usually only about 24 hours. And then they're heading out for orders and delivery. Um, as far as like when I use it to design, you, know, you bring them in, you give everything a fresh cut again, make sure none of the foliage is in that vessel with the water. We don't want any bacteria, it looks really sloppy. Um, good floor snow, we don't have foliage in the water. That's a big pet peeve of mine to see that mm -hmm. places. Um, and then that's it. And they, they last a long time, I think. I know that sometimes they get a bad rap of not lasting more than a couple of days. But honestly, if you're harvesting them at the right point and your care and handling is on point, um, they're going to last you a good five days is what I feel. Maybe you get a fluke one that doesn't. Yeah, you, you, the base life on your dahlias has converted me to someone who will use them because I never okay. never liked them. I remember that when yeah. we first met. You did not like dahlias. I did not understand. I know. My favorite. Yeah. I thought there was something wrong with me. Which there may still be, but at least I'm <laughs> better about the dahlias. And you know, you, they just have to be cut at the right stage. You don't want to cut them when they're blown open out in the field because... Sure, maybe someone's using that that day for an event, but it's not going to last. And then if the petals are falling off, people are not going to want to buy your dahlias. True. Yeah. Question is, what is that lovely flower you're using? Yes, so what is this beautiful? This is Cosmos, right? Oh, it is. It's Apricotta. Apricotta Cosmo. And I think this is my very favorite Cosmo. Um, the centers, they change. I mean, like, what do you even call that color? Um, I mean, it's got a little bit of a lavender in the sure. center. I mean, it's it's kind of antique vintage-looking. It changes. The colors change. 
I love it so much. And it's not a huge seller for me. Um, my whites and my double clip poop bon bon sell better than this one, but this is my all time favorite. It goes with so many things and it looks so classy, I think. Yeah, and how how is it to grow? To me, I think of it as a, I don't know how else to say it, a dirty flower. Like it's it's a messy one to grow. Is it not, I think of it like the um, Larkspur because of the, the uh -huh. way the foliage is. Yeah, it's yeah. always, to me this would be a fussy, fiddly oh. flower. Um, you have to be on your game with it. So, so, um, the, okay, here we go. The ideal way to harvest this flower is at bud crack. I don't know where the camera shows this or oh, whatever. Right. Where right. Where is, yeah. So this is like bud crack. It's just starting to show the color on the petals. That's ideal. You cut it when the stems look like this right here, you're going to get so much base life on it. But there are a lot of people who want to purchase it because they're using it that day, already wide open, or they want to know what that flower is going to look like. So I tend to cut them when they do have some open, but also where they have the bud crack. That way, as this flower blossom is done, other ones are opening up and you can just snip it off. Now, when you're out there harvesting in your field, you have to cut these every day. I did run into about a three day time period where I was not cutting all of our white cosmos because there was so much going on and I didn't have anyone out there helping and we had to go through and like deadhead all of them and for me the easiest way to do it was just cut them all off as if it was a stem I was going to sell, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Throw it out and let the plant start over and I swear the next day they were ready to go into the crack <laughs> stage. Um, but if you stay on top of it, if it's something that you're harvesting every day, it is so easy to keep up with it. I don't think it's this, uh, fiddly at all. And I don't think it's really a dirty flower. I just think they're so pretty. Oh, I'm enchanted by them. The color, and of course we're in the studio where the lights are really, really bright. Um, but the petals um, are very opalescent, I would say. Yeah. yeah, the color, that, that transition from like a peach to a cream to a magenta with a little bit of yellow undertone, but backlit with the lights, they literally are glowing. They glow. I yeah. don't know if it shows up on camera, but uh, and I want to smell it, and I know it doesn't really have a fragrance, but, but it's just foliage. super. The foliage kind of has a I like the foliage. kind of herbaceous, mm -hmm. it's clean, um, a clean scent to it. And there's little dancers, and you have to love the dancers. Exactly, you get some beautiful movement. You know, you'll see the, the Instagrammers with their bouquets shaking them. It's like, are you palsied? What's wrong here? But, you know, you're getting that beautiful um, dancing yeah. movement that is very popular for wedding work, but also just kind of the design style that we're seeing, mm -hmm. that lighter, airier, um, softer look, I would say more feminine, but it's just, uh, it's very enchanting to see. Leanne. Uh, repeat the name of that Cosmo. That oh, how everyone's going to grow these. <laughs> yes. They're great and shit. We have for a lot of people that are growers because they're also asking, do these things open more after you harvest? So two questions. Name? I, I the Cosmo. Um, it's the Apricata Cosmo. And do they open more? Yes. So remember, you want to cut them when they are just coloring up on the bud. Just where you're just seeing the color. I mean, that's when you want to. And it'll continue to open. And so like this right here, um, as they bloom out and they fall off and you cut it, this one will already be opening. So they do continue to. I don't know about the tight little green button ones, probably not, but any of them with the color will. And then will dahlias open as after you cut them? So, so you have a dahlia to talk about. Dahlias. Um, that's kind of a tricky question, really. I, I think you have to know which variety of a dahlia you have and the best time to cut it. So, like this little one right here, I don't want to break it off. This little one right here is, um, what I say it was, Pink Runner, maybe? Mm -hmm. That one's really pretty. It will kind of continue to open so that it's not, for me, it's not quite a ball, but it opens a little bit more. I tend to cut them when they're a little flatter on the face, maybe like 75% open. Um, and they will, because if you think about it, if you had a dahlia, you know, if you bring it home and you have it in your vase, it does kind of continue to bloom open and die off. It just doesn't look as pretty. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to cut it too young. You just have to get to know your dahlias. You can get out there and try them, do some um, base samples so that you know the best way to cut it. There's so many different ones, yeah. Good. And Leanne, did that, did that answer the second part of your question as well? Okay, good. Yeah, well, that helps. we have time for probably one more question, if there is any question. 
I think I have all mine. How about you, Carolyn? Nope, that was it. Okay. Just saying a lot of love and thanking you for sharing your knowledge. They are so to. happy to have you here. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, here. well, we love having you. Yeah. And um, it's been a treat to have you play with flowers with me today yeah. and bring your beautiful, beautiful product. And we hope that you, tulips, have learned something new, not just about flower farming and flower harvesting, but just something maybe exposed to a new flower in general. So as you get out there and do something you love, plant a seed, and um, have a great week. Bye, guys.